So, sorry to have been so long to do something supposed to be so simple. Um, so I'm going to talk about some things uh, with a different perspective from what you have seen here. Uh, maybe I have to introduce myself. I'm uh, what people call a media artist, um, producing media artwork for more than 30 years. I'm also a professor at City University of Hong Kong and also uh, maître de conférence at uh, Paris 8 University. Um, and I've been working with, the, you, you will see, I will talk, to, I will talk mostly about uh, things related to VR, but uh, maybe with some conceptual aspects that are uh, usually not treated in this kind of, uh, of talk and in this environment. So, as Simon mentioned, uh, I found this slide from 2002. Uh, this slide was made by David Nairn, who uh, used to work uh, uh, with me at Zeta Production when we had this company during 15 years until 2003, and we did a lot of things about VR, interactivity, exhibition design, using interactivity and uh, augmented reality and all this stuff, uh, including one of the very first TV series uh, made of uh, computer graphics in the early 90s called Quarks. Uh, so we started with that and that was a pretty funny thing to do for a very small company, you have to understand. It was not small, but it was with, without money, let's say. Uh, so financially uh, small, and we did this, uh, this series, uh, and it's about living beings that are totally weird, uh, but I was very frustrated after uh, when we made it, so it was broadcast in prime time on different national TV channel and private TV channel in 13 different countries, maybe more, because I'm not following. Uh, but I was uh, frustrated because uh, as the quartz was conceived, they were supposed to interact with the world in a way or another. These living beings are supposed to share the space with us, but they are totally invisible. Um, and to have that just as an animation, a pre-rendered animation, that means uh, there is no, uh, there is a missing dimension, which is uh, virtuality. I will start saying some very banal things, but sometimes it's good to, uh, to come back to that, sorry, to come only at the end of the, of the conference to talk about this kind of question. So you're, of course, aware of the difference between virtual reality and virtuality. Uh, personally, I always considered that I was mostly interested by virtuality. Uh, you know that virtuality, of course, is a required condition of the world, as we know. It's very simple. Uh, we know that virtuality is part of reality. Uh, and the first evidence of that, just imagine that you remove virtuality from reality and you stay stuck before the Big Bang. There is no reason the Big, Bang, the Big Bang happens if there is no virtuality. That means things stay like they are, totally actual, but uh, with the total incapacity to, uh, to change or to evolve. Or... And, uh, of course, uh, the interest for me to introduce interactivity in art was to consider that virtuality could be the medium. And the artist could work on this very specific aspect uh, which is to uh, consider that things are not totally predefined and this is the interaction with the people that will generate some specific response which is uh, conveying the sense and the meaning of the work. Uh, yeah, so we are supposed to talk about VR and uh, so I started working with VR in 93 uh, considering first a project called uh, Art After Museum, I proposed to make a collection of contemporary art made of VR inside the VR world, inviting artists to make artworks, uh, to make uh, artworks that would be specifically designed for the very specific, uh, um, the very specific space and properties of VR. Uh, so you can find the description of this on uh, academia.edu. There is a text called Art After, uh, Art After Museum, and it's a, it was a kind of manifesto where I explain how we play with the properties. Uh, should we use, for example, gravity? Uh, should we consider the space is uh, uh, full or empty? 
for example, which is not obvious. Everything has to be decided. Does it rain in VR? Uh, do we have any uh, expression of materiality which, uh, that would be different from what we know? Uh, after working one year on this, I understood that I took more time explaining the artists what they could do, and I, maybe I should do my own work with that. And I started to make a VR installation, and the first question for me was, is the VR space full or empty? And my answer was very simple. It's, if it's empty, whatever we put in it, we see it immediately, so there is nothing to discover, and so what the point? If it's full, we don't see the things, so we have to do something. And I did the first of the series, the big questions, called Is God Flat? Oh, the, it's a, the series is called The Big Questions, and this one is Is God Flat? So you're in a room surrounded by bricks, and you discover that the world is full of bricks. So it's a very human-made world. And in this world, the only way to, to move is to hit the wall, and you have a corridor dug in the direction where you go whatever the direction, that it has to be horizontal. After a while, you understand that this is a flat world, uh, because you cannot go up or down, there is no exit, and if you're lucky, you find images floating in the space, and you can start collecting these photos, which are these images, which are actually images representing the gods that are supposed to have created the, uh, to have created the world. Of course, after a while, collecting images may be not enough. And uh, you just, uh, you understand there is no exit, and you, uh, you enjoy the fact that you can modify your survival uh, space. And it's, uh, uh, of course, uh, it, it is a kind of uh, metaphysical video game, because there is nothing to win, and this is pretty close to a certain experience of the world and of the life. And so it's a metaphor of life. Uh, but the question is, this place was habited, inhabited only with pictures. So I decided to, uh, because Canal Plus, a French TV channel, wanted to uh, me to put something at the booth at Imagina. So the previous one was in 94. Three months after, I proposed them to do Is the Devil Curved? Which is the second of the big questions. And the question is, uh, is VR innocent or smart? And uh, I started using a, a neural network uh, in order to create a personality and to give a personality to a specific character. So this is... Um, I just uh, would like some sound. Yeah, <coughs> interesting. Sorry, I know what it is. It's here, and I have to say, for example, to use that. So, is the devil curved? Is in the sky? We dig corridors in the sky, and there is living beings in the sky. Uh, this living being is made of uh, five spheres. So it was designed for Canal Plus. You know, so, uh, those who know the TV channel um, may understand better why. Actually, the success of the channel was made of uh, uh, broadcasting porn movies uh, on Saturday night, the first Saturday night of the month. This is how they started and made a lot of money with that. And also a bit of, foot, of soccer, football, and, and, uh, um, and, and uh, movies. So, this thing is coming to you. It has an autonomous behavior made of five years, and actually, it has a mission. So this is where you see the map that people couldn't see if you dig it up, because at the beginning there is nothing, uh, except the sky. And so this thing is coming to you. If you stay with the thing, come closer, touch it, you give it pleasure. 
And this can go up to, let's say, orgasm. If you go away, another one will come to you with a different combination of spheres. And, and the, actually, the computer is trying to see if you stay longer. This is based on the model of the prime time TV program. Based on a very simple idea, usually, you know, you have, the, uh, you have the, the, guy or the girl presenting the program saying, oh, you're with us, that's great, we love you. We love you, stay with us, please. And then they change continuously uh, the duration of the different phases of the show uh, in order to keep the maximum of audience by monitoring uh, the feedback from the audience. Uh, and this is exactly what this thing is doing, you know. So the sound is uh, coming from uh, porn movie soundtracks, and uh, this is totally dynamic, and it's trying to find the best way to combine the five spheres to, to get the, bigger, uh, the biggest audience. Uh, so it's, uh, at the same time, it's a bit of VR, let's say, not, not immersive VR, because it was just a big screen, and taking the older the field of view. And inside was a kind of uh, little, simple, primitive AI uh, having a mission, which is seduction. The same year, I worked on trying to see if it's possible with VR to connect people. So this was a tunnel under the Atlantic, dug in 95 between the Pompidou Center in Paris and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Montreal. So you see the pipes. Uh, I put big pipes for two reasons. First, uh, the museum needed to have something that looks like art, so it has to be an object. <laughs> the second one was that a very powerful Barco projector at this time were something like 800 lumens. So you need to protect the light in order to have something on the screen and you can start interacting. So on the top you see the people in the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in Montreal. And in the bottom, this is uh, in the Pompidou Center. During five days, people have been, six days, people have been digging in order to meet the other on the other side. They dug into a material that was a cultural material, so into pictures becoming like blocks of marbles. And if they dug a lot, they got big caves like that with fragments of memories remaining from the previous digging. At the same time, they were talking to the people on the other side. And the voice, was, uh, the voice was telling them where to go in order to meet. Uh, of course, what the difference is, they can talk, uh, we can say they meet, but actually they meet only when they can see each other. So inside this uh, uh, virtual tunnel, we have the video of the diggers floating. So it was possible to have a real meeting. And this is the first meeting, but it took five days. We can see you in Montreal. Everybody says hello. I can see you. You're dressed in red with a white color. So that's after five days, you know, it's difficult to describe the emotion at this time because people used to come to stay one or two hours and come the day after and come the day after. They didn't have to pay to get in, so that was very convenient. And, and uh, of course, people coming five days in a row uh, expect something happening. They wanted to be there at the meeting time. And they, they've been there. So what I would like to... Uh, Oh, I hate computers, but I hate keynotes as well. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do something like that. Okay, so what was in... T for me, each work I designed was a kind of manifesto. Uh, I was trying to define what could be done in this field. So it's a dynamic user-centric architecture. That means there is no pre-existing shape. The shape is a result of digging, of coming, and of trying uh, to meet people. Le, the dialogue and the sound and the voice uh, and the music were specialized depending on the events related to what was happening. 
The next tunnel was a generative music made with Jean-Baptiste Barrier. This one was more composed in a relatively classic way. We had a real-time video chat in VR, inside VR. This, v this VR world was made of two, uh, from two continents. People had to be synchronized, and the space has to be synchronized, and sound, and the content, and the shape. Uh, so uh, we created uh, the Gadi Vu, which is uh, coming from a, uh, an expression from Quebec, uh, who was in charge of selecting the next pictures of the next picture according to the to the time we uh, span uh, in front of the image and what we focus on. If we are interested in something, it becomes a kind of preference, and it's, so the system the Gadi Vu is a kind of recommendation engine, and that became later. Uh, Ergonomy, which is, was a big research program that ended in 2014, uh, which uh, uh, allows people to find what they could look for uh, in a database of millions of pictures without knowing what, what is in the database. Uh, the dynamic uh, image database management, so that's it. And uh, at the same time, it was creating uh, a video documentary in real time. So we have a virtual director doing editing, uh, changing the cameras according to, uh, to the people speaking or not, and uh, looking at something, and, and I have 21 hours of digging uh, recorded uh, that had become now a video without any editing. The editing is the original from the, from um, the thing. Uh, one, of the, uh, one, one of the findings is uh, the importance of fatigue dimension of communication. So you are aware of the fact that uh, uh, in uh, communication theory, uh, there is a dimension which is very important, is when you establish a contact and uh, how you maintain it. Uh, usually it's something very simple, like, hello, can you hear me? No, no, I can't hear you. Also, please, please, say, speak louder, or move from an, uh, to another place. Ah, uh, oh, I can see you now. Uh, and then, so all this process is a fatigue dimension. And in the tunnel, it was mostly the fatigue dimension that was applied because people didn't have something specific to say. You know, you're dressing red with a white color. Maybe talking about the weather uh, or the job after a while, but most of the time it was just, I see you, I hear you, uh, which language, where are you? And, and very basic question. And now, what is interesting, this was in 95. So with a social network, you know the communications made more than 80 persons made of purely fatigue exchanges. We are in touch, it's a magic mirror. Look at you, you exist. Show me what you're eating. Show me where you are. Show me, no, nobody asks. You do that. So we do naturally something that we don't need in terms of communication but maybe we need in terms of social relation. So the tunnel around the world was uh, later. I just want to show you that because of the interaction. Uh, this was in 2012 between San Jose in California, uh, Seoul, uh, Hong Kong, and Montreal. I just asked my students in Hong Kong to interact with the scene without telling them anything. It's just a screen, we are in daylight, uh, and uh, they move in the database of the French cultural uh, database of the uh, Réunion des Musées Nationaux, that means the French Museum Collection. And here it's more to explore, to use the ergonomy thing, to explore the database without asking for anything. Why I show you that is uh, to talk about the interaction. You see, I still consider that I don't really need a headset if I want the image to be of good quality. I prefer to have just a big screen, or bigger if possible, and to have something like a physical relation to the scene that is uh, simple. So you see what they do. They will swim. They will do even swim backwards and, uh, and do crazy things. Actually, they can do that, and it works just because there is no constraint. The only thing I'm measuring is the distance. I don't care about what they do. And so, even if they do that, they come closer, and then, 
So they see that it's doing that in, the, in one day, and it's exactly what would happen in, if the world would be tangible, if it would be a physical world. And so they were very happy. You see, this, is, this has no importance, and I, I track only one person. There can be a group. So the thing is not to reduce the possibility and to tell the people what they should do. Oh, put your arms like that, and then like that, and then this. And this means that you have to learn a code, and I think we don't need to learn codes, and, uh, and, uh, and we should have just something natural. So if you stay in the middle of the space with something on the ground, that means you, d you don't move. And if you go forward or backward, you go in forward or backward in, backward in the database, which is constantly renewed and adapted. So then meeting, she's meeting somebody. Uh, 2016, uh, I did a, a kind of um, elephant symmetry, you know, the, the, and th this is, um, the it was the 20 years of the tunnel, so I decided to make it like, uh, like the bones and the skeleton of the original tunnel. And this was a color tunnel. You dig into colors, sounds very innocent, but related to a city. So in Hong Kong, it was Hong Kong yellow, Hong Kong red, and all of the images you find on the web related to these keywords, uh, you were digging through, and which could be controversial there. And this is a borders tunnel. Uh, the borders tunnel, uh, it's taking the name of the country, borders, and you have to go through this image of borders that are mostly military, uh, military images. In terms of remote communication and communication in VR, in 2000, still with David now. David, are you here, David? He's not here, he's guilty. He left yesterday night after the, the dinner. Uh, so, uh, Labilog was, um, Labilog, uh, was an installation connected in three different locations, like Brussels, uh, Lyon, and uh, Dakar in Senegal. And it's a, it's a tribute to Borges, the Library of Babel. And you're moving in a kind of labyrinth which is totally unlimited, I cannot say infinite. And you talk with the other people like in the tunnel, but you cannot see the other. And in your voice, some words are recognized, and uh, a text is written by a virtual writer who tries to tell something about your, uh, your encounter, your meeting with the other. And, and then the text is read, and the text is written on the wall you're looking at. So if you move in the space, it's like you're creating the pages of a book you're exploring by moving and meeting somebody. But at the same time, it's a story of your meeting. And it, uh, uh, Jean Baptiste Barrier made the, the 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 music work based on voices, reading uh, the letters and reading the words at the same time. So when you move in the space, in kind of core, uh, raising from the different parts of the space, and uh, that's it. This is where we are. Two thousand. Quasim talks was a year before. And it's also about remote communication. How people behave when they. They are in the same space, like in the cave here, or when they are in a remote space, like internet situation here. And so you're in a space which is made of caves. Uh, I mean cubes, not the Plato's cave, but uh, the, the VR2 cave. And so you're in a cave, and you're in a world made of, of cubes and where the walls are actually the face of people talking through the internet. And so you can talk with them, I mean, few of them, one in each room. But the problem is how you navigate in this space, because there is no door, there is no window. So uh, according to where you are in the space, I just speak louder, I don't know the microphone. According to where you are in the space, the space can tilt. And According to the angle, it goes faster or slower. But if you want to talk to somebody very far away, you have to talk to the people, uh, to the people sharing the space, the physical space with you. So you have to say, please don't move. Can you put, can you stay here so I can talk to somebody there? This is what I call the uh, the the leaf syndrome. You know, when there is an accident, when there is a problem, people start talking, talking with the other people in the lift. Otherwise, they say nothing. So this 
And then and it's very important, I think, uh, in a close communication with people we don't know. And we have that very often in VR. So uh, I think it's interesting to, uh, to, uh, to see that. And, um, and it works pretty well, because if, if you're really on the side, it can go very fast. So it's a kind of crazy situation. Sometimes you can talk to people far away, but it's also uh, that you are, uh, you are actually maybe falling somewhere, you don't know. You even had rats coming from the, from the bottom and going up and avoiding you, of course. Or why it was not funny. This was in 99 in uh, Tokyo. So, uh, in some discussion ha I had with people, <coughs> Uh, and mostly artists, very often they say they want to do something which is kind of pure VR, you know, no physical object, no interference, no hy hybridation. <laughs> and I think this has to be discussed. So uh, for me, what is important is not only uh, if the pe technical performance is uh, good, if we found technical solution, but it's also, uh, it's also what kind of situation do we propose? What do we have to say? the people, by creating a specific situation, they could live in and react to. So World Skin was in 97. Uh, it was commissioned by uh, Ars Electronica Center. And uh, it's, a, it's a cave installation, so it's a cube. You have people sitting in front of the, the cave. Uh, it's, project, it's projected all around, including in the ground. And so it can be a group of people. You see your body, you see the other. For me, it's a priority. So I have a big problem with uh, most of the headset because I don't allow these simple things like you've been talking about uh, seeing one's body. You play with the fact that it's something different. So this difference is actually making sense. But there are many cases where you don't have anybody. So when people talk about presence, I would talk about absence. What is really striking is the fact that we are absent in the space. And actually, most of the people don't care if we are there or not in the virtual space. So we should uh, discuss uh, this. So World Skin, I just give photo cameras to the people. They are a group of people, and so they are in a landscape which is made of flat things, cutouts of photos of the Second World War and the Bosnia War. And when they make photos, when they take one photo, what they take is removed from the scene and is printed out. So instead of creating memory by making, taking photos, they are actually shooting in a space made of photos and they erase the memory. Or they appropriate the memory by taking, taking away the prints. And of course, it was in Linz, you know, Linz was also the city of Hitler. Uh, so it's not totally innocent. The title is uh, World Skin uh, Photo Safari in the Land of War. And, and all this is about uh, some, specific, um, uh, some uh, specific topic. It's not about technology. It's not about VR. And at the same time, some people were presenting works with a very VR-like, very colorful environment, uh, and 3D characters in that. And I was, on purpose, doing something flat, but with a big space around. And so yeah, this is a photo camera, a very banal photo camera, so people naturally use them. And the sound, the trigger sound of the camera became, uh, of course, gun sound, but very smoothly, so people couldn't notice the evolution and just enjoy the fact to erase the traces around them. So when I say uh, it's important to make sense in a way with what we do, uh, here the sense is coming from the experience itself, otherwise it's just photos. The sense is coming from the collective experience. There are people making, taking photos, some others don't. And I remember Masaki Fujiata staying half an hour inside and asking the other not to take photo, not to disturb the move inside the space. That's interesting, you know, it's how people appropriate the, the, the space and, and uh, do, something, uh, do something specific that fits their need or their, uh, their will, their desire. Okay, oh, yeah, this is, yeah, this one was a, with a group of people. 
Hallo, wir waren ja. Ja. Genau. Thank me. Oh, I have to go much faster. Okay, so this is the kind of uh, photos people used to have printed because we are still in 97. Uh, augmented reality on the Arc de Triomphe. I did the permanent installation inside, inside the Arc de Triomphe. Uh, but I did two kinds of augmented reality. Uh, not this one, which is just putting the camera where you put the flag. But this one, this is augmented reality. Uh, I made a very small art that people could take in their hand, use their sweat to alter the surface. But this is, this is actually controlling that, which is a Korean screen made of a, it's a 3D screen, volumetric screen. And the other one behind is a scale one sculptures. And so when you turn it, you see where this is on the arc. So no, uh, no goggles. Uh, and uh, we did also the prototype. So this is the model. Uh, the prototype of an uh, augmented reality telescope that was 2009 for two different kind of uses. Oh, okay, I had one slide for that, I don't know why. Uh, one use is uh, getting information about reality. Another one was to offer the possibility for the artist to make specific content. For example, I wanted to make a sky, a weather, that would be related to the emotional state of the people according to the district. So on this district is rainy, this one is very sunny and so on, and try to see the impact on the people, how they would appreciate their district to be always rainy when the other have a sunny one. I'm sure they would change their mood just because they wouldn't like one to lie about what they feel, and second, uh, to have a very negative, uh, to give a very negative vision of the district. Um, I started in 2000, so that was also in the Pompidou Center to work on the collective retinal memory. I don't want to show that now, uh, but this was, okay, we have no time for that. Uh, it's another one about collective retinal memory. Uh, Cosmopolis was in 2005 in China, in four different cities, Shanghai, Chongqing, Chengdu, Beijing. It's what book a lot of people call VR, uh, but it's mostly 360 uh, photos. And so I made these telescopes like that on purpose for kind of intensive use. And people could, uh, so this is uh, the project, 12 screens, big panorama, 12 telescopes, screens to see what people see in the telescope, 32 sound channels. Uh, people were watching panoramas like that from 12 different cities around the world. Uh, Sao Paulo, Soweto, Chicago, uh, Cairo, uh, Barcelona, Paris, Berlin, uh, Hong Kong, Chongqing, Chengdu, and uh, Beijing. You see, it's not tourist panoramas. Panoramas about how the city evolved uh, to try to understand something about this evolution. And the collective memory, actually, the collective retinal memory, is the fact regard. that we share something. Oh, sorry. I no, 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 not at all, please. The double body thing. But <clears throat> when you look at the panorama, what you look at become painted on the retinal memory. And as there are 12 people looking at 12 different panoramas simultaneously, they are building a specific city made of only the elements that draw the attention of people. Um, so that's uh, uh, the concept, and it's a palimpsest which is in constant evolution, uh, as people have no reason to stop watching. And uh, so, let's make it short, some features of the thing done before it was in the uh, Zeppelin uh, uh, warehouse uh, uh, for the, um, uh, in uh, close to Paris for the testing, then he went to, uh, he went to China, this uh, science museum. Uh, here, it was something more than 10,000 people coming every day. Uh, this is why it needed a very solid uh, telescopes. I was very interested in how people behave. 
And they came in the family, oh, this is the opening. I cannot resist to show you the opening in Chongqing. This is a, this is a real exhibition opening. And so they, this is all about how people behave, the lighting on them, and how they look at things, uh, how they don't care. They, are, they take their children to, uh, to um, show them this fantastic thing, which is watching photos. Make it faster, because I feel you're nervous. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, I don't show you that. So I just uh, finished, uh, you give me four minutes. It's a lot. Okay, sublimation. Uh, now I work on two, um, two aspects that it seems to be opposite in the world we know. It's sublimation, which is the fact to go from solid to gas without going through uh, liquid. But it's actually, I use this term to describe the fact that we want to convert the world uh, into data. And these data want us to be able to use them, to compute them, either with a computer or with our brain. Reification is exactly the opposite, using our brain to convert our thought into things, into objects. And uh, for Marx, it was, of course, a way uh, to, um, uh, for the alienation of people, uh, focusing on objects and not about feelings and, and, and thought. So brain factory is something you can see in uh, the Musée École de la Pyrine, in the garden just in front of the uh, the cell polyvalent. And it's about this sublimation reification thing. And it's precisely about reification. And so the idea is quite simple, is to convert abstractions, human abstractions from our brain directly through BCI. Uh, I wouldn't say BCI, uh, but uh, using an EEG and to control matter in order to give a shape to these attractions. So what is the shape of time? What is the shape of space? What is the shape of love? What is the shape of desire, of democracy, of revolution? I don't know. Revolution, at least, is something concrete. But there are many things like that. We have no shape. And if people believe that freedom is a woman with a light in her hand, uh, I would like to have more arguments for that. And so here, the, the thought that was a very primitive version, but this is converted into, um, uh, into objects that are printed out. So uh, maybe I just uh, show you. Uh, so for this, what is important is when they do that, the process helps them to create a concept DNA, which is a series of features, of properties, specific to one concept. And this can be inherited, and another one can come and inherit what you have defined as a DNA and conceive uh, an evolution of that. So it is an evolutionist model. And so this is, a, a, at the right, you see it's freedom. Uh, yeah. So it's also a metaphor of the, of the knowledge economy. OK. I, so this is about artificial life, evolutionist model, using natural selection uh, in an ecosystem which is a brain. The brain is the ecosystem for the thought, uh, proceed, proceeding to a form of morphogenesis and uh, working on the concept of uh, using the model coming from AI uh, to use, again, it shouldn't be AI, the second one, but NI, natural intelligence, uh, to um, proceed like we do with the adversarial uh, networks. And we are not controlling the shape, we are assessing the shape. So all is based on the fact we try to understand how you express yes and no. And this is a database because this goes to a database and you can see the evolution, explore it and uh, it print it out. And this is a brain cloud that will open next month, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, actually uh, Instead of printing, it's a big uh, LED bulb uh, cube showing your brain activity at this uh, time. Thank you. Thank you.